Judges have been very, very good to me, you know. Even the judges that uh, uh, had very difficult times with were very good to me, you know. I think of the times that stick out in my mind and uh, I was working a trial in Buffalo with Justice Gossel, who is, I believe, no longer with us. And it was a medical malpractice trial, and it went, I believe, that trial. I did a couple long ones in Buffalo. I think that one lasted nine weeks before we finally got a verdict in the case. Um, and there was a defense attorney involved in that trial. His name was Carmen Tarantino, who also was not with us any uh, longer, um, uh, died at a young age. And Carmen was a formidable, um, boy, you know, the crap really hit the fan, so to speak, and they were really angry with one another. And Judge Gossel stood up from his bench, and I was down to his left, and he was pacing back and forth behind the bench, hollering at these three attorneys, and the three attorneys were hollering back. And I'm writing crazy, and I'm thinking, you know, my old, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> and the deputy came in from out in the hall, and he had a note in his hand, and he came up and he gave it to the clerk, and the clerk read the note, and she immediately handed it to the judge, and the judge read the note, and he immediately stopped what was going on, and the note was from the jury, and the note read, we can't hear you. <laughs> so, of course, the judge... Uh, you know, eventually called the jury back in, not quite first, the judge recessed court and we went back into chambers. When we got back into chambers, there was an issue with one of the clerks and the attorneys were basically questioning the clerk about something that had happened with some paperwork or a witness or something. I don't even remember what it was, but I remember how badly I felt for her because they were really putting her through the third degree. And Judge Gossel was behind his desk and he was ticked. Ticked that they were uh, uh, asking questions of his clerk, which he had to allow him to do because the issue dictated it. And she got up and she left. And when she left, it just went crazy again. And Gossel was behind his desk and he was so angry. And Carmen now, is in the chambers and he is pacing back and forth and he is hollering at the judge and the judge is hollering at him and Frank McGarry's sitting down there and he's piping up every once in a while and the other individual who was back was kind of being quiet and the judge, and I'm right, I mean I am right, I'll never, this was probably one of the craziest moments I ever had as a court reporter because it was just really intense and the judge said something and Carmen snapped and he was behind the desk and he came up and he put his hand on the judge's desk and he said you never liked me you never congratulated me when I won a case and Gossel is back and forth and Carmen was I'm convinced this day was crying and I was just it was unbelievable to me that I was sitting in this chambers and that this was happening and I thought to myself, I can't believe that we're going to go back out there to the courtroom and the jury's going to come in and they're going to sit in the box and the judge is going to say, counsel, you're next witness. <laughs> and, um, and, and it was crazy. And I had the opportunity to do two or three trials with Carmen Tarantino. Uh, and um, of all the attorneys that I've ever worked with, I look back on Carmen as one of the real treats of my career because he was uh, an outstanding attorney. I remember he came up to me uh, about a third of the way through that case and it looked strong for the plaintiffs. It was a young little baby that had been uh, deprived of oxygen at birth and she ended up as a severe uh, a handicapped child in a wheelchair that could do nothing for herself and it looked really strong for them. And I remember Carmen coming up to me about a third of the way through that trial and he and I knew each other pretty well. And he said, you watch Jerry, you watch. I'm telling you, I'm gonna win this case. I'm telling you this case, I'm gonna win this case. I'm gonna make that attorney cry. You watch me, I'm gonna make him cry. <laughs> and I remember at the end of the case, after it was over, Carmen won the case brought in some doctor at the end, 
had some bizarre testimony about white s spots in the brain, and he could tell that the baby was susceptible and was going to be born this way no matter what. And he did. He broke that. Up to, he, and he, he turned that attorney into, uh, uh, he, was, and he was from the Paul Bell's firm, a very, very good attorney. And I remember him sitting at the table with his two clients, mom and dad, behind him, trying to console him. And he was shaking his head and he said, I don't know. I heard him say, I don't know. I guess I'm just not that good of an attorney. And I remember thinking, damn, <laughs> this was a brutal case. Nine weeks that case went. And uh, that was, I, I, was, I was glad that case was over. I was glad that case was over. Now, did Carmen, he was, you said he died at an early Carmen age. Carmen died, died uh, Carmen died about five years ago, and I do believe Carmen died of a heart attack. He was a fiery individual. Oh. He was way up all the time. Carmen was yeah. way up all the time. Uh, he was he was very well liked by the court reporters because Carmen was very good to the court reporters. Um, and he was a lot of fun to be around. You know, I mean, he really was. But... Uh, Boy, what a trial attorney, what a trial attorney. Probably the best defense attorney I've ever seen uh, do cases, you know. But that was, uh, you know, <clears throat> judges. Judges get angry too. Judge, tough on judges sometimes, you know. You know that, was a, that was a difficult case. And you know, they have plaintiff's judges and defense judges. You know, Judge Gossel was a good judge. I thought he was awful good to me. But there's a few judges in Buffalo that are considered plaintiff's judges. And if you've got a big case and a plaintiff's, uh, uh, you represent a plaintiff, you know, you're trying to pull certain judges up there so that you can get your case in front of them. And, uh, you know, other judges aren't. But So it can be very frustrating for a judge, too, when they're dealing with competent counsel. Talk about counsel, Tom. No, inevitably, you had a Carmen in your career as well. Somebody who was demonstrative, somebody who you'd say, wow, what a show. For better or worse, what a show. Because that's ultimately, Jerry said, this is, at some point you click in and this is entertainment. Did you have somebody? Well, you know, I, I, I failed to mention uh, working with Bill Foley, he's left, but I, I meant to because we covered a lot of the county uh, back in those days. And I'm going to answer your question, but back in those days, we had a, district attorney who was Sid Hughes and then uh, Bob Sullivan and uh, Catchpole, I can't think Park. of the Park, Park Catchpole was the assistant. And then we had two ADAs, Bill Foley and Bud Wright. And that was the DA's office, you know. Uh, today, just like everything else, I mean, there's tons of people working in all these offices. Uh, when I started in family court, we were on 4th Street where the truck driver <laughs> left me off. We were on the second floor above the hardware store. We had probation down the street. But anyway, <laughs> I used to really enjoy it when Charlie Colasano, God rest his soul, would get into it with Bill Foley. Oh, and they could, could they get into it? Oh. I always said that that's how I got into Supreme Court, the passing the exam for Supreme Court because of Bill Foley, how he would argue and, and really go at it as an assistant district attorney. But uh, yeah, I guess that was my biggest challenge was Bill. He was, he was a fast speaker. And another time we had Charlie Colasano in family court and he got so, he used to get so excited. And he said to Judge Palmer, Judge, I gotta get out of here. He said, I got a client full of offices. <laughs> 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 Paul, oh, who was that nemesis, that, that uh, attorney that you just couldn't quite, maybe, or I should say, just the, the one who was kind of Jerry's Carmen? Who would that be? I don't say nemesis, wrong term. Who's that memorable attorney that you used to transcribe for? Uh, be more specific, because... I, oh, clearly, somebody, when, when you knew he was uh, either as a prosecutor, defense counsel, you knew it was going to be... Oh, I, I, th I was afraid you meant personally that I didn't like personally. No, no, no. I, really I knew you liked everybody personally. Yeah, I, did, I really did. I didn't love John. That's a no. given. Oh, no, John Gidell was okay. I mean, he <laughs> was hard to understand, but he was, he tried to help you, though. I mean, I mean he did one time. It was a murder trial. 
story. He said, Mr. Canal. And this is before a jury, and Judge O'Connor was the uh, presiding. He said, Mr. Cadell. Yes, Paul, what is it? What is it? What is it? I said, you are turned your back to me. I can't hear you. He says, oh, Paul, I can't stand in one spot all day. So I looked around at Judge O'Connor. Fight your own fight. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll wing it. <laughs> Tom? I, you I remember, just remember the, the attorney who uh, listened to him during the trial for Judge Jankowski, City Court. And I think I hope you remember it. He mentioned the fact that he talked to the shorthand. Oh, you Jack Scott. Oh, yeah. I was thinking yeah. of you that. You don't remember that. Yes. I, I was thinking and of that. <laughs> at a jury trial, he'd come and say, he'd say, jury in? Or, no, jury out? Jury out. And then, jury out? I said, what? Jury out? This is just in conversation I couldn't understand. Yeah. <laughs> Just another quick story. I hope my stories are quick. I don't know how many of you remember Moose Peters, yeah. the deputy. Yeah. And, and Moose, anybody else you would have felt sorry for about this story I'm about to tell you, but not Moose because he was a needler. He was a great guy. Bought a couple of RVs from me even. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he got, he got the Jamestown PD to buy them too. But uh, he just was, he was needling me all the time, you know. And we're in the federal building down here doing family court. Judge Hallenbeck was the judge. And Moose had a habit. He would sit in a chair in the courtroom that had wheels on it. And he would lean back on that chair. And I remember, I think, Bill, you were there in court. And Wayne Herrick. And he, the chair went out from underneath him. And he fell flat on his butt, and he's sitting there. I am laughing so hard, the tears are coming out of my eyes, and I, I, I don't know what I was writing. No one was laughing. Wayne Herrick, I think you, Judge, were there. I'm, I'm not sure. But, um, and I look up at Judge Hallenbeck, and he's got a straight face on. He's, you know, and, and I'm thinking, I got to stop laughing. This is just, but it was so funny. And for weeks after, I'd be sitting at my desk or something, and I would think of that big lug sitting on the floor there, and I would start to crack. People would say, What are you laughing about? You know, that was funny. Scott, it had to be there. It had to be there. Scott came up one day to Evelyn Letter, the clerk of the court, and he says, Georgia. And then one says, What? G Georgia. And she said, I'm not sure, you'll have to ask Bob over there. <laughs> and Scott's, and Scott's, what did she mean she's not sure? So afterwards, sure. she said, well, I'm not sure. Uh, they call him like, Jack, what's he talking about? Did Jim draw a jury yet? <laughs> I remember I worked for a judge in Potter County, the only judge I worked for in Potter County. He was a real strange bird. He ended up being removed from the bench. <laughs> but he, at the end of every case, would look down to the prothonotary, which is the equivalent of our clerk of court, and he would say, do it. And the clerk would pick up the gavel and bang the <laughs> At the end of every case, do it. <laughs> and he'd bang that gavel. Well, when transcripts of mine started coming out, at the end of every transcript were those two words, do it. <laughs> Bang. So one day I came into the office and Bertha, who was his secretary, said, oh, Jerry Judge would like to see you. <laughs> so I went in and I sat down and he said, Jerry, uh, I'm looking over one of your transcripts here and I noticed that at the end of the transcript it says, do it. <laughs> he said, what's that all about? And I said, well, you know, geez, Judge, at the end of every case, you say, do it. <laughs> and so I write it down. He put his hand on the table and he said, Jerry, what are you trying to do? Make me look like an idiot? <laughs> <laughs> no, Judge, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to make you look like an idiot. In my mind, I'm thinking, Judge, you don't need any help. <laughs> but, you know, they... Kind of goes into a little bit of, you know, you try to take care of your judges a little bit, you know. 
if you like them, you're <laughs> your judge, you know. That judge fired me uh, after two and a half years. Uh, he did oh, it. Do you remember, he did it. Do you remember the time Judge Adams purchased a winning lottery ticket? It was the Marmar. We were having a beer after a murder case, I think. And he purchased a lottery ticket and won $100. I wasn't there, really. I, but I heard all about it. Okay. About he, he, wasn't, he wasn't the same guy for a long time. <laughs> did he buy a beer? Well, you know, the story was, I thought it was you, the story was he didn't want to pay the income tax on it, so he sold the ticket to you for $85. I, no, he sold it to I think he sold it to Tony Caprino. Oh, maybe that's it. Maybe he sold it to Tony He wanted, didn't want to pay the tax on it. So You're right, it really did happen. I heard it. Jerry, what's the question you can't wait to ask Paul Keating? I don't have any questions for Paul. Thanks, thanks, Jerry. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, no, you know, I uh, I know what Paul did. I know what Paul did. He did it with a pen and paper, but I, I know what Paul went through. I know what it was like for Paul to be in the courtroom and, and to be making a record. And Yeah, I, I think it's a universal thing. I really do. It's universal. It's gone from Paul right through Tom and right to me. And... And it continues on, and it'll continue Hopefully. on. And if court reporters continue on, that's right. A lot of courts now are going to take. Oh, yes. Court reporters are dying breed. Sure. I don't know that I would encourage any of my kids to become court reporters, no, because I'm not sure that they would have a career in it. I'm confident that my career, uh, that I'm confident that I'll be able to retire as a court reporter. But uh, although the, uh, it is shifting a little bit, you know, everything that you see on TV now, uh, all the closed captioning, all of that is court reporter somewhere either in their uh, uh, living room, in their pajamas, uh, working through the computer systems or, um, you know, wherever. But they're all court reporters somewhere that are doing uh, all the closed captioning, and there's closed captioning uh, almost everywhere nowadays. So. But, uh, no, with all respect to Paul, uh, uh, no, I, I honestly don't think I have any, nothing that I would like to ask Paul, because I know he's been there, and Tom's been there, and I've been there, and just like all engineers have been there, and all judges have been there, you know, and all attorneys have been there. When I was a kid, they told me 50 years, but I like shorthand so much that time, that'd be enough for me. That's right. Yeah. I look forward to retirement. Oh, yeah. I look forward to retirement. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Is the uh, record something that the public can ever access? For example, I was uh, talking to a young uh, law student, and I was saying, he was in Chicago County, and I said, if you wanted to do some research, there was a famous murder trial, the Hallett murder trial back Oh yes, the original is filed in Albany. Okay. It's probably everybody's look. Oh, I just saw one the other day. Nobody's got it. There are other other records of the Allen somewhere that the lawyers have got from the Daily to try and find them too. And then I, I understand that they get about four or five requests every year. People are going to write a story. And Carol Adams, the judge's daughter, was going to write a story. I mean, she's talked to me a couple of times, and she hasn't. Along the line, they they give up. Mm -hmm. Isn't a copy kept with the county clerk? Must yeah, be somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Copy, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And Tom, I'm surprised you'd ask that question because you know a court reporter will send a copy, uh, sell a copy of a transcript. You just know. <laughs> 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 you just have to ask. Paul, tell them about you thought someone bought a copy and you tried to chase them down and you called them in South America. South Costa Rica. Go Costa yeah. Rica. Peter James, remember the local yes. writer, the local writer? He wanted it. You saw, but it wasn't it wasn't the Hallett file when you called. Yeah, and after after talking to him for, for a half an hour or no, I was the bill was 110 bucks. And uh, it turned out to be it was a mistake he might have ever saw. <laughs> he didn't even know the right guy. All right, questions from the audience. Who would like to have that one or remind one of these guys? of the story that we haven't heard so far. Judy, you got another one? Well, Paul, you got another Paul Keating story that we need to get out? I have a well, list. I don't think, he didn't mention that, you know, he was the, in the Judge Advocate General's office and he could have gone to Nuremberg. Uh -huh. And um, he was young and he decided to get out. He could either get out or go. No, he tell him what I said. Get out of the tell him what I said. The nightclubs in New York City are a lot better than the Russian bear. I'm staying right here. <laughs> he also was the only person who 
he's ever known who never took basic training. <laughs> well, I, still was right the... I was still in the hospital with a hernia. <laughs> <laughs> the first dead patient to make PFC. I sold it, sold it on my nightgown. Never took any basic. Well, I think, too, you should say that the Hallett trial about Dr. LaHote yeah. and when she was giving the medical examining things, she, they found, they were trying to say that it was all set up. Oh, they well, you know, I think that's what you're talking about. She, well, it, it, she, she went along sing songs, Z body of Robert Hilly was so and so high, weighed so and so much, had so much this and that. And, and about after 15 minutes of the body of uh, Grace Marie and uh, Susan Allen, and they could fall asleep. But did they have to do that, as a matter of fact? And it turned out to be Bob Sullivan saw the thing and caught it. She had testified that she didn't know too much because everything happened upstairs. And she knew there was a terrible fight going on and a lot of noise and all, all confusion and everything. The one, the one she just couldn't understand, but she said, I heard three champagne pops, like, and Harold Land, our court officer, who was one of the finest straight shooters I've ever known. I, I thought he was having a heart attack when she said that. Because I, I was a big uh, gunman. No, the, and, uh, part, the part you wanted to know is they were trying to say there was a setup. They were going to get money so that she wouldn't have insurance money. No, but that's the other way. That's what I said. So she didn't get screwed out of the money. That's right. But, but Harold Ann said, she's a, she's a GD liar. Yeah, that's what she said. She said, she's a GD liar. And as soon as they had to reach us, he came over to me. And he could hardly talk. He says, there's three of those cartridges went off. They blew up. Well, that's what happened. Yeah. Well, that's what happened. Yeah. 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 Yeah
conviction uh, without a body, murder. Uh, it involved two brothers. They were painters, house painters. One didn't like the other at all, and it just kept brewing. Uh, he, the one brother was gay, and he also was the mother's favorite. And this guy was working on, his brother was working, we'll call the brother the defendant and the other one the victim. Uh, the defendant was trying to figure out some way to knock him off. And uh, the defendant used to go uh, bowling every week and they'd stop at a particular restaurant. This could be made into a movie, this one. This is really interesting. It was to me anyway, taking it. And they had a certain waitress and uh, the defendant said to the waitress, you know, my brother and I don't get along well. And he has an opportunity to get a big construction job. But I can't tell him about it because he won't believe me and he'll think something is up. And I need you, the waitress, to do me a favor. She said, sure, sure, I'll do it. So the defendant tells her to call him at his home. And at the time he was living with an, an older lady, I guess she had an apartment there that she rented to him and she was like a mother to him. And uh, if you would call him and then tell him that you are the secretary to this construction company and you want him to meet Mr. Smith, your boss, at a certain spot. She says, sure, I'll do that. When do you want me to do it? Well, if you call maybe tomorrow. So she does, and in the meantime, he's very excited about it. He goes out and buys a new attache case and some new clothes and so forth. And in the meantime, the defendant goes to a um, gunsmith and gets the sights on his gun all lined up so he can knock them off. And um, in the meantime, the brother goes out uh, during the week to this spot to meet this man who believes is going to give him a job. But on the way, he stops at a diner and he tells these people in the diner where he's going and that he's got this big job and so forth. So anyway, he goes there and the news that night this was, by the way, this Judge uh, Sprague from Cattaraugus County he asked me to work with him on it, and it was an Erie County case. But anyway, uh, the news comes on that night and talks about a car being burned at a particular location, but there was nobody around. The girl, the waitress, comes home that day and hears the story about the car. She says, oh my God, she said, that's where I told that fella to meet the, the supposed boss. She says, I don't know what happened. So she tries to get a hold of the defendant and she can't. And so then she calls the state police and then things start happening and uh, they arrest him and he says, I, didn't, I don't know anything about it, and so forth. So then the story comes out from her, but they still have no body, and they search that car, that burned car, they can't find anything, and they find some um, uh, pieces of flesh and so forth out of that spot. In fact, I was marking them in evidence. They were in little <coughs> plastic containers and so forth. But the DA's and, and the defense attorney on that was uh, Nelson Cosgrove, who became a Supreme Court judge after that. And there was two district attorneys from Erie County on the case, and they had worked a long time to put this thing together. And his star witness was going to be the gunsmith who was going to come in and say, yeah, this defendant came into my shop a couple of days before this incident happened, and I worked on his gun and so forth and so on. But Cosgrove made a motion and said, hey, wait a minute, we don't know if this person was killed or this flesh and so forth belonged to a human. He said, I, I don't think you can call this witness. 
So Judge Frank said, well, I don't know. I'll hear the testimony without the jury. So he puts the jury out, here's the testimony of the gunsmith, and the judge says, no way, we can't have it. <clears throat> the lead DA on that case got physically sick. He said, I have to take a half a day off. He was so upset because there went his case. So we did, and we took the other witnesses in. Long story short, they came back, and they convicted him. Went up on appeal, and the appellate division upheld it. Now, if Judge Sprague had let that in, the appellate division would have thrown that case out. Not thrown it out, but they would have said, you have to try that case again. And so it was good what Judge Sprague did. But it was a very interesting case, the witnesses and everything else. It was many years ago, and I can still think, remember it. I'm done. <laughs> Jerry, you gave me a picture of uh, a courtroom a replete with a bunch of uh, stuffed animals. I thought this was for Judge Cass. Yeah, that was, uh, what, uh, what, is, what, what was this that all was, about? That was a case I'll just mention real quick. You know, it was really interesting. This guy uh, uh, got into snowmobiles back in the early 70s. He ended up selling his franchise up and down the uh, northern east coast made all kinds of money and he loved to hunt and he would travel all over the world and he would hunt um, and he started a little uh, uh, museum and it was called the Fin, Fur and the Feather and one day a couple of federal agents were coming through his small town and they saw this Fin, Fur, Feather and they thought hey let's go in there and check it out and see what's going on so they went in and he had hundreds of animals in there, and as they were walking through the shop, the one looked at the other and he said, you know, I think that animal's in danger. And so they ended up uh, arresting this guy, and uh, he had been smuggling endangered species, killing endangered species, and smuggling them back into the United States. And it was a big trial. It became a big trial, a big deal. Um, the uh, Safari Club International sent people in to testify in the case, uh, and other. Uh, organizations to testify about the animals, what they were, where they came from, when they became uh, endangered, when they, uh, prior to when they were endangered, uh, you know, either, there's an African wild dog in that picture which he had taxidermied under the guise of it being a beagle, um, a couple of uh, sorrows in there and uh, different things, but that was an interest, that was a really, really interesting case. And of course that was federal court, there was no photography allowed in the courtroom under any circumstances. But we were also interested in that case that the judge did allow us to take one photograph, and that's the photograph. When I came to Chicago County, Judge Willard Cass knew this gentleman that I uh, was talking about. And uh, so we talked about the case uh, many times. Uh, and the ironic part of it was um, that uh, they appealed the case, and uh, he lost the appeal, and he went to federal prison. He was in federal prison for a number of years on that case, as it was a very serious case, and at the time, I think, was one of the biggest smuggling cases in the United States. And he went to federal prison, and when he came out of federal prison, he started hunting again. And he started shooting animals again, and animals that were on the endangered species list and he started smuggling them into the United States again, and he got caught again, and he went back to prison again. That man had a lot of money. He was a multi-millionaire, all through snowmobiles, which he was able to uh, uh, make a killing in in the early 70s. No pun intended. And he turned it, <laughs> turned it into this uh, uh, thing that he had. But you know, federal court was an awesome time in my life. I, I had. I just had such a fabulous time in the federal court. It was in Williamsport, Lewisburg Penitentiary, which is one of the maximum security penitentiaries in the United States, was right there in the neighborhood. We handled a lot of cases from the Lewisburg uh, Penitentiary. They were fascinating. It was unbelievable uh, what the inmates in the Lewisburg Penitentiary would do, what they would try to do, the different things that they would do to try to get themselves either out of the pen or advanced in the pen, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, when I started in the federal court, and Paul reminded me of this because he talked about a case just a few minutes ago, and he talked about what a sad case it was. And then Tom talks about a case that, you know, Tom will never forget, and it was kind of impactful uh, for him. But when I started out in federal court, you know, I've been a reporter really not that long, only four years, you know. 
I started in Scranton, I went to uh, Potter County and worked a couple of years, and then I went to the federal court. And, and I won't tell you how I got there, but it was, you know, just, uh, uh, it was just a chain of events that took me there. Um, and shortly after I was there, the uh, Pennsylvania state treasurer and the Pennsylvania Democratic chairman were charged with bribery and uh, currying favor. And it came into our court in Williamsport. His name was R. Bud Dwyer. And the uh, chairman's name was Robert Asher, I believe. Asper was the gentleman in the tax theory trial. Asher, I believe, was uh, the gentleman with R. Bud Dwyer. R. Bud Dwyer was a big man, uh, a lovely wife, um, but he was kind of a dumb guy, or he was perceived as a dumb guy. And he staunchly denied that he had done anything wrong. And they had a, the main witness in that case was a man who I had heard about in the trial before he testified. His name was John Torquato. This was a long time ago, and I remember these things, and I don't think I'll ever forget them. John was supposed to be a real greasy, snaky character who was the only individual that was accusing R. Bud Dwyer of bribery and the charges that he was charged with. He came in and testified, and he was truly lived up to his reputation as I watched him testify. Uh, he, you could just tell that this was the kind of guy that any one of you would meet and would realize that he was not the man that you were going to eat dinner with that night, nor have any type of business relationship with. And I was convinced throughout this trial that our Bud Dwyer was innocent. Well, one day during the trial, I went down to the local Ginetti to have lunch, like I always did, because it wasn't very busy there and I could always get in and out easily. So I went there, I go into the dining room, and nobody's in the dining room. So I sit down at this table and I order my lunch, and I'm all by myself in this big room. And in the door comes our Bud Dwyer with his wife. And they come up and they work their way through the tables and they sit down at a table that's about from Paul and I away. <laughs> And I'm sitting at my table, and they're sitting at their table. And Bud looks up and he looks at me and he said, well, this is really ridiculous. Why don't you come join us for lunch? So I picked up my plate, and now I'm thinking, boy, you know, should I be doing this? What's, you know, golly, I'm young, I don't really know. So I picked up my plate, and I went over and I sat down at the table, and we had a lovely lunch. He was a funny guy. His wife was a dream. She, she was just such a lovely lady. And I don't mean physically. I mean she was just such a lovely lady, you know. Well, I was really kind of taken with these two. So the trial goes on, and at the end of the trial, our bud is convicted. And he was devastated, and his wife was devastated. Now, at the time, I was living in Wellsville, New York, and I was working in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and it was about an hour and a half drive between the two, and I did that for eight years, back and forth between Wellsville and Williamsport, working in the federal court, hour and a half there, hour and a half back. So, sentencing came for our bud, and I knew that it was coming up on this day, and I had to be down in Williamsport for the sentencing, so I'm up in the morning, and I'm in my car and I'm driving down to Williamsport and I'm listening to the radio, you know, and, and it was one of the Williamsport stations that I was listening to. And onto the radio comes the um, uh, news story that our Bud Dwyer had called a press conference, uh, you know, early in the morning. He was supposed to be sentenced that day. He was preparing to, you know, uh, uh, hand himself over to the marshals after his sentencing. And during the press conference, opened up his briefcase and pulled a 44 Magnum out and committed suicide in front of the cameras. Uh, and they actually, and you can see, you can tell, you know, that it was kind of, it was emotional for me. But they ran it on TV. One of the TV stations ran the suicide on TV. And, to, and there was such an outrage over it that they withdrew it, of course, right away. And I did end up seeing some footage of it later, not the actual shot, but I saw leading up to that. And, um, that was, and I remember I was halfway to Williamsport and I heard that on the radio and I'm like, wow, holy cow, you know, what, what is going on here? Of course, you know, I know, knew them a little bit from having lunch with them. 
And that case is one of the impactful cases that I've ever taken. I, and as you can see, it's, it's emotional sometimes when you get into these things and you take these cases. Um, and they leave impressions on you and impacts that are lasting, lasting forever, really. But uh, that, was, that was really something. That was a big case. I've taken a lot of big cases. Um, that was a big case. That, that, was a, that was an emotional roller coaster, that case was, no doubt about it. Postscript uh, to that story is Cindy, uh, who was Judge Cass and Judge Adams' first law clerk, and of course, first female law clerk, my wife. Uh, would drive back and forth from Meadville, Pennsylvania when she was attending Allegheny College and Dwyer was attending Dickinson Law School and with, with me. And they would travel a lot together. So we got to know the Dwyers very well because he was, he was a, a, a state representative for Meadville and then subsequently appointed to the elected of the state treasurer. So that all happened. Let's talk about devastating. For us as well, so uh, sure. I'm delighted you delighted you brought that memory back up. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, well, it was, it was, <laughs> I'll never forget it. I'll, I can live to be Paul's age, and I'll never forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, by the way, how old are you, Paul? I haven't I haven't figured it out yet. Judy, how old is he? Eighty nine. Eighty nine. Wow, oh, that's he's gonna kill it. Oh. Gordy, eighty nine. Yeah. That's that's part. what what is is there is there an impactful case? We've heard a couple here from Tom and, and Jerry. Was there the case that you know you embedded in, in your Grace House? Many of them, but I, I try not to get only a certain distance. Uh, I can see what Jerry meant, and uh, I like to all of a sudden say, well, you know, "Hey, I mean, what How about that first one that went to the chair that you took?" Oh yeah, well. Uh, that, that didn't have an effect on me. <laughs> effect on him? <laughs> you didn't get fried. I don't think so. <laughs> Ironically, though, uh, we all, first case we had that I remember but, but about that before, uh, a guy in Frewsburg named Reed, he, uh, he went to the chair. And uh, he it was a bum. Got to Attica and picked up his brother, I think it was. Who, no, I mean, the, the guy, the brother was a bum. Took him home to his house, fed him and took him like that, and subsequently raped his wife, 28 year old, 28 year old, month, month old daughter, and strangled both of them. And they had very capable lawyers. One was Bud Wright. And the other was Willard Cass Senior. Yeah. And he gave him a heck of a shot, he really did. But uh, that jury wasn't gonna let that guy go. Mm -hmm. No way. And I, I stayed, I just didn't, I took it out of my mind. I, I saw my little boy there, but he was 16 most of the time, so now you don't do it. It's a, it's a good question, Frank. How, how do you guys walk away from this? I mean, you hear some pretty gruesome sure. testimony, and the day is done. You, you put your machine away. You put your notebook away. How, how do you how do you distance yourself? What's you the technique? Drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I stay in, Paul. I stay in. No choice. Yeah. No, seriously. I mean, how does how does how do you do that? What's the technique? No technique. You can no do technique. Doctors, nurses do it. Right, judges do it. Yeah, Lawyers judges do that it. are involved do it. You know, you judges get very oh boy, this the pressure on judges is unreal. Yeah. Paul, was that case a uh, death penalty case that you did? Was that the, yeah, the case they, where the guy went to the chair? They, they, he went yeah. to the chair in July. And did you try that case? Did you do that case? Oh yeah. Yeah, see that's very, very unique because Paul has done uh, a capital case. See and they don't course, have them now. They don't have them now. Yeah. Uh, when I was in um, Cowdersport, Pennsylvania, I got involved in a capital case. They're yeah. fascinating cases. Oh, yeah. You'd think that uh, they're fascinating cases. Uh, this young kid was uh, um, a gasoline sniffer. And he, his mind was as fried as any, any individual I think I've ever seen. He killed a man in um, the Genesee, Pennsylvania area, which was up around Wellsville, close <laughs> to where I grew up. 
and he was arrested and he was taken to jail and he was being housed in the Potter County Jail. When they went out to exercise one day, the, uh, they, they had been doing some work in the yard of the jail and they had a ladder out there and they had the ladder in the yard. They'd forgotten to take the ladder out of the yard and when they took the prisoners back in, this kid still had enough wherewithal. He kind of snuck around the corner and he stood next to the wall. Of course, they didn't do an encounter or anything. It was Potter County, Pennsylvania. They probably had eight, ten people in the jail. You know, it was it just was not like Chautauqua County Jail, for sure. And this kid got that ladder, and over the wall he went. And he was on the lam in the hills of Pennsylvania um, for uh, probably four or five days. And he came down out of the hills, and he murdered a farmer and his wife as they were uh, coming back from the walk. And so he was in the hills again for probably another three or four days. After about eight days, they were able to find him. And they charged him with capital murder, and it was a death penalty case. And it was like any other case, except that. And I don't know, and I'm curious about whether this happened with Paul. But after the trial, there's a conviction. And then you go into really what is a separate trial, and it's called the death penalty phase. And the rules change during the death penalty phase, and the evidence that can come in is almost um, uh, anything goes. You're able to bring in any kind of testimony regarding this defendant that you want to, to try to show why, look, this guy shouldn't be put to death. This is the kind of life he had. This is the kind of parents he had. This is how he grew up. This is how he did in school. Almost anything could come into evidence during the death penalty phase. He happened to have a particularly excellent attorney from down south in the southern part of uh, Pennsylvania. And what an outstanding job he did for this kid. And I honestly was sure that the jury was going to give this kid the death penalty. And closing statements came along. And uh, um, the defendant, and of course the prosecution, I can't even remember whether in the death penalty phase the prosecution closed first and then the defendant, because the defendant really had a lot of leeway in the death penalty phase. But at any rate, that attorney got up and he was giving his closing uh, remarks to the jury and doing a fantastic job. He really was a very excellent attorney. And he was making his way down the bar along the jury. And when he got down to the end, the Bible was laying there, and he picked up that Bible, and he had it right over the jury box. And he said, uh, remember, ladies and gentlemen, thou shalt not kill. And he had that Bible. And they did not give him the death penalty phase. He's serving time uh, in Pennsylvania for life. He was a very young boy at the time. But it was a fascinating uh, case and it was a fascinating procedure that was gone through um, and not many people have the opportunity because it doesn't happen in New York State and I just happened to be in a place where I was in Potter County for two and a half years there were six murders during that time three of them that was that was, three of them was that very very quickly Okay, well, I'm sorry. No, no, Paul, that's, I'm just curious my daughter, about that. My daughter lives just three miles from Hartford, and they had a case that was unreal. Uh, it's going to be, well, how do I start? These two guys were professional house burglars, and they saw this guy's car, white Cadillac, in a supermarket, and he's an endocrinologist. His wife is supervisor of nurses. They've got two kids, 11 and 13. And they said, hey, this, this is a good shot. I love that. So they went down and followed the car and got to where the house was and saw two lights on. And they figured, well, that's a rule if there's nobody there. Well, it so happens that the two girls were upstairs reading Harry Potter. They broke into the house. First of all, they killed the, they thought they killed the doctor, but they didn't. They did kill the mother. They raped the both girls for several hours and then lit the house on fire. Well, they didn't. 
The cops were outside. They thought that there was nobody in the house. There was a big argument about that. But, so they, they were both sentenced to the chair. The first guy, uh, he was a Russian kid. That's one of these adopting kids. And he had a personality problem. So the other guy was a professional house burglar. And he, they both got the death penalty. But since then, the, Connecticut is not a hotbed for death penalty, to say the least. They took the death penalty off. Now they said that they, they, afterwards, they will keep the, the death penalty on for those two only. And you can imagine the kind of legal battles that are going to be coming up in, in Connecticut. You and I will both die of old age by the time that thing is so. A couple of things about the Reed case that you alluded to earlier. The uh, case went to the Court of Appeals. It has to automatically. And automatically. And it was a 5-2 decision affirming the conviction. So then my dad and Bud Wright went to see... Oh my God, Bud Wright. Uh, went nice to, to see... Nice to see you again. Governor Harriman. To see if Governor Harriman would, uh, 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 I forget what it's called, commute, commute. commute the sentence. And Governor Harriman denied that, and uh, he was executed, and it was the last execution in Chautauqua County, and my dad went on a two-month drunk after that. <laughs> the night that, <clears throat> that he was to be executed, Bud Wright and Bill were at their home, and their parents were away. So Carol decided that they shouldn't be alone, but shouldn't be alone that night. So we invited him for dinner. And many martinis, and I thought he'd forgotten. It got close to midnight. He was going 59, 58, 57. It really was a, a very tremendous impact on blood. I would have no problem going like that as far as being upset about that, with that, that kind of condition. You know, if they, if they needed somebody to pull a switch, I'd have done it for them. Yes, sir. In that case, in that case, yes. Last words. Jerry. Jerry. Anything for Jerry? This is your chance. That one story that you knew we needed to get out today. Uh, there's too many. I will say, though, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, when I was in 10th grade, I was poor at maths and sciences, um, and I honestly had no idea what I was going to do in life. And I think my mother, well, I know my mother worried about me. Now, I was number six of seven, uh, and I was the first one uh, to go to college. Not that we didn't have the money, it's just that I was, well, I wasn't the first one to go to college. I was the first one to graduate from a college. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I was in 10th grade and I decided to take a typing course. And I excelled in it, much to my own surprise. And uh, uh, I ended up being really a very good typist. And when my mom saw my grade in typing, she said to me, you know, Jerry, <clears throat> your Uncle Tom is a court reporter and with such and such is a court reporter, you, can, you should consider being a court reporter. And I remember I, literally said at that moment, okay. <laughs> and I started gearing my studies towards, you know, business math and typing. I, I continued on in my typing and, you know, because I really, the only thing I was interested in was hunting, fishing, and sports. I mean, that's where it was at in a small town, uh, especially for a kid who was poor at maths and sciences. And, and so, you know, I went to Alfred and I mentioned earlier that I pulled a three-year stint in a two-year program. And, I went to Alfred the first year, and I lived off campus, right next to a bar, and <laughs> failed out my first year of college. But I had developed a very good rapport with the head of the court reporting department, and he also happened to be my counselor at the time, guidance counselor, and he suggested that I take filler courses for the second semester and then start court reporting all over again. And I did that, and I started court reporting all over again. I buckled down, I got my degree. Uh, I was able to get that first job down in Scranton. 
And uh, I will say that I love court reporting. I love court reporting. It is a great career. And, you know, you get to work with great people, and, and especially within the court system. It's just fantastic. The, 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 uh, uh, the, te the subject matter is fantastic. Um, the entertainment is fantastic. <laughs> the hard times are challenging, but fantastic. I don't know, looking back, if, if I would ever accept any other career. And you know, I don't think I'm kidding anybody here in this room when I say that um, for having an associate's degree, I make very good money. <laughs> and, I'm, and, I, and I've been able to support my family with that. My wife and I have three beautiful kids. We have a beautiful home. We have a nice car for her to drive, and I drive my piece of crap truck. <laughs> and we've got two daughters in college, and we've got a boy who's about to be a sophomore, and, and you know, we're doing okay. And uh, you know what? I love court reporting. It's been incredible to me, and uh, I know that I'm confident that these two guys love court reporting. You know, it's it's just been a great career. It really is. And I appreciate Greg, you know, giving us the. I don't know that we necessarily deserve the opportunity to sit here, but I appreciate the opportunity to sit here. Greg, I think that's a good Greg, can I just one more sure, thing sure. about Paul? Uh, when I was a trying case as a prosecutor, Paul was a great sounding board. Believe me, he had a great sense of how the trial was going. And during breaks, oftentimes, I would go up to Paul and, and he would uh, give me some advice. He might say, you better concentrate on juror number seven. I think you're losing. You're losing. <laughs> or, you know, he always, but the best thing I love to hear Paul say is after I had rested the case, we take a break and Paul, I said, Paul, how'd I do? He said, they better warm up the cars for Annika. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> up the sheriff's car. Sheriff's car for Annika. And they did. Court reporters, a jury of one. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Keating, Tom Moldani, Chair Lambert.